Hi everyone, I'm Eric Nelson. I taught here at Georgia Southern from 1989 until 2015. So I was here a long time. Was in, have been in this room many, many, many times for poetry readings and visiting writers. So it's nice to be back. Um, I'm going to tell just one quick, there was, I've been thinking about different stories to tell and I'll tell one quick one, but first I want to thank Andrew, wherever you are, for bringing this uh, collection out. When Ben wrote me and first told me that this collection uh, was going to come out with Peter's uncollected stories, um, you know, I was just so happy and so excited and, and I also was thinking, you know, it's about damn time <laughs> that somebody is doing this and so I'm really, I'm really grateful. 1111 11 Press is bringing this out. Um, he was such a beautiful writer and such a beautiful person. I'm going to read a short story that's one of uh, my favorites of his, uh, The Year of the Purchase. But before then, um, I was looking through, I've got a little box of Peter Christopher papers and memorabilia of one kind or another also, including um, this six pages of uh, writing workshop notes that he used in his classes. I don't know if he ever used this as a lecture, or do you know? Is it a lecture? Or, you know? We're going through his stuff now. Okay, um, so it, it's just his thoughts on both life and, uh, and writing, and for him, I think those two were so inextricably bound that, you know, if he talks about one, he's talking about the other. I'm not going to read all six pages. Uh, but I will read a few that I think are particularly uh, relevant for us. Um, why do it? I write to stay alive. It is the best way I have found to manage my life, possess my life every day, manage my death, which comes for me as we speak. Why do I do this? I do it for the same reason we do anything of value. Does it enlarge me? Does it help me manage my life? Does it help me live and die? Yes. Yes and yes. Um, so the, the first few pages are largely about life and, and writing and, and finding that inner space that Andrew was talking about to write from. Uh, and then as it goes along, it gets to be more and more specifically about writing. Um, he says, you are paying with your life. Write, don't write something trivial. Um, I'm not going to write this sentence unless it gets me in trouble. <laughs> you can always be a little nervier than you think you can. The extent to which you hold on to something is the extent to which you fail to grow. You need one great sentence at the top of the page. Answer that sentence honestly, unpack it as if it is a suitcase. Only the first sentence allows you to go on to the next sentence. Answer that sentence and go on to the next and the next. Your writing should say, look, I'm going to tell you something you have never heard before. And when I'm done, you will feel differently. Come with me. I'm not sure where we are going, but we will go together and it will be wonderful. He says, always write the whatness of things, never the why. What is it? What is it? not why is it. A story begins with a wallop and ends with a wallop with plenty of truth in between. And uh, Affirm the majesty of being as opposed to complaining about it. And that was, that was a real characteristic of his, was, uh, to affirm the majesty of being. What did he used to say? Uh, Every day was another day in which to excel. <laughs> uh, say something about the notion of being alive that no one else has said. Um, so remarkable notes. I think he must have used them in class, Terry. Did you ever hear him say any of these? Yeah, so many of them sound so familiar. Just even talking to him, you would hear him say those kinds of things. And I think in class as well. Uh, one quick story. Uh, Peter was a very calm presence. Uh, he, he, was, he was an intense presence, but a very calming presence at the same time. And uh, the best example I can give you of his, his calmness was when he was over at our house for dinner one night, and he was sitting in a chair that could look into the living room, and the rest of us couldn't see the living room, but that's where the stereo was, and was playing some jazz music. 
appropriately. And um, so we're just all talking and eating, and Peter glanced in the living room and he said, your cereal's on fire. <laughs> and so we all sort of chuckled, ha ha. And he said, no, really, it's on fire. <laughs> and so we all got up from our chairs and went in, and there, Stephanie had put a candle on top of it, and it had melted down, and the plastic started burning. And it was on fire, just as Peter said. But uh, he was so nonchalant about it. It was amazing. You thought it was a hippie statement. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> So I'm going to read the year of the purchase. This is from the manuscript, uh, which he gave me a copy of. Um, and I, I promptly spilled coffee all over it. So nearly every page has a coffee stain on it. The year of the purchase. Is this your good shirt with the frayed collar and cuffs? My mother says to me. Before I can answer her, my mother answers herself, let's go for a new good shirt. Goldberg's is where we go. Behind these windows is the same display of faded Mackinaws and plaid shirts I believe I remember from nearly 20 years ago. The door opens to the same clack of bell and clapper. The smell is the same smell of new shoes, belt leather, mothballs. Come in, come in, says Mrs. Goldberg from the dark at the back of the store. Red, put the lights on for these customer people. Fluorescent tubing hums, fluorescent tubing hums light on the glass case holding clasp knives and buck knives, compasses, belt buckles. Stacked boxes of dress shirts are on top of the case near the shirts for this season, hunting shirts and sweatshirts. Shelves from floor to ceiling support the weight of new jeans, stiffness, straight legs, bell bottoms, boot cuts. Near the cash register is the cardboard cowgirl that as a boy I had wanted as my girl. The cowgirl, young as ever, advertises her jean brand while sitting on a fence, admiring the bronc writing of a cowboy I wished was me. Mrs. Goldberg, who was old when I was a toddler, sits old as ever in the shadows at the back of the store. Red, come tell these customer people of ours about the sale we are having, says Mrs. Goldberg. Radio tuned into high school football comes from the back room. Cheerleaders clap up a cheer. Dickie Desati makes the tackle. The home team has the ball on their 20. Red has them all in the back room as if somehow in miniature. In this room, my mother looks at shirts in boxes as if she is looking down into the lives of boys and men. I look at my reflection off the glass of the case. A man all the ages I am looks back. A man 37 years old whose mother is still buying his clothes for him looks back. This one might fit you, my mother says to me. My mother puts a shirt into my hand. The shirt is an Oxford blend, buttoned down, white. The price, written in ink on a sticker, is $24. Before I can say what I should say to my mother, who wears my old army jacket, sweatpants, sneakers with the heel backs broken in as if she is wearing slippers, my mother says to me, you should have at least one good shirt. Listen to your mother, says Mrs. Goldberg, and then says, Red, listen to me and turn off that radio. Come take care of these customer people of ours. Keep in mind the sales bargain we will give them on a good shirt. My mother snaps open the breast pocket of a long sleeve cowboy shirt with pearl snaps for buttons. I lay the white shirt on the glass case, safekeeping the shiny desires of boys. The home team has driven to the Chicopee 10. Red opens the curtain that closes away the back room. Red comes to see what he can do for us, not from folding pants in the back room so much as if from the bleachers below the press box at Noel Field. My God, Red, what little that is left of your namesake has turned white. Why is it I thought of you, Red, as young as ever, the same as the cowgirl? Red takes a look at me. I remember you, says Red. You're the one who broke a long one in the last minute against Husak Valley 
and fumbled down near the five. Yes, that's me, I say. How are you doing, says Red. Still fumbling, I say. Fluorescent light flickers over all of us. The home team goes in for the winning score. True to Mrs. Goldberg's word, my mother pays $32 for both the white shirt and the cowboy shirt. On our way home through the great light failing is when I say to her, Mother, please forgive me, please.